Hello, everyone. I am Patrick Reich, one of the pediatric infectious disease faculty at uh, St. Louis Children's Hospital. And this is a great time for us to talk about tick-borne illnesses because, as you all know, uh, this is really something that we're seeing pretty commonly um, in our offices right now and will be over the upcoming months. So the um, objectives of today's talk are that we will, sorry, it's just not advancing. There we go. Um, sorry, I have no pertinent disclosures. And the objectives for today is to just give a brief overview of the types of ticks that we see in our area, review some of the most common uh, tick-borne illnesses that we see in our region, and we'll focus really on the clinical presentation, diagnosis, and treatment, uh, and then briefly talk about some precautions and how we can prevent tick-borne illnesses. And uh, I think it's just fascinating to see that really uh, all the time we're seeing new pathogens identified, some of which uh, really present similarly to other known tick-borne illnesses that have already been described. And there are a couple of really great resources. The first that I use most often is the CDC website, and there's so much information about ticks in general, um, the areas where you can find specific ticks, and then so much about the epidemiology of the different tick-borne illnesses, regardless of which part of the country you are practicing in. And then there's an MMWR from 2016, and then a reference manual that gets updated pretty frequently, most recently in 2018, that also contain a lot of information. Okay, so just to talk about some of the tick-borne illnesses we see in the U.S., uh, the, the curve at the top right really just shows that overall there's been a pretty level number uh, just under or right at 50,000 tick-borne illness cases reported to the CDC each year for the past five years. And at the bottom right, you can see which uh, tick-borne illnesses are most common throughout the U.S. So Lyme is always the most common. And then ehrlichiosis and anaplasmosis is typically second. Spotted fever group rickettsiosis is typically third. Uh, and then you see a smattering of others, including babesiosis and tularemia. Um, and we see some of those illnesses locally as well as STARI. And I think that one of the things that is most frustrating about ticks is that uh, they really are effective vectors, right? Um, so they feed on host blood and the host range is really quite variable. Um, they're pretty um, uh, resistant to environmental stresses. Uh, so it's hard to get rid of them and they have high reproductive potential uh, with some trans ovarial uh, transmission of some agents. So they're just really, really, really efficient vectors of some of these diseases. And then the picture at the bottom right and even to the right where there's a dime size uh, coin for reference is some of the lymph and uh, larval stages of ticks. Nymph and larval stages of ticks are so small that you may not even see them with the naked eye. So we really don't even uh, rely on people knowing that they had a tick bite or that they found a tick on them. If they were in a, an area where they were at risk for tick exposure, we usually consider that as enough of a reason to consider tick-borne illnesses in our area in the summer. So in terms of what we see in Missouri, um, in our area, there are four ticks that we see most commonly. So the first being a lone star tick, there's a picture of it right there. And this can transmit ehrlichiosis, tularemia, STARI, and Heartland virus. You can see that uh, the American dog tick has a similar distribution as the Lone Star tick, but actually it goes a little bit further west, north, and is found in California. This can transmit tularemia and RMSF. We also have the black-legged tick in our area, and that really extends eastern um, for the entire eastern half of the U.S. And this can transmit Lyme disease, anaplasmosis, sometimes ehrlichiosis, and Powassan virus. And then lastly, the brown dog tick is found everywhere in the continental U.S., and it uh, is a main uh, way of transmitting RMSF. And then when you look at where these um, tick-borne illnesses are concentrated, these are the four that we really see, um, uh, well, three that we really see here and one that we really don't see in Lyme disease. Uh, but you can see that ehrlichiosis at the top left uh, is really focused on the Midwest, Missouri, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Kansas, and then a smattering on the East Coast as well. 
When you come down to spotted fever, rickettsiosis, which includes RMSF, also a lot of concentration, Missouri, Arkansas, Tennessee, but then also extending eastern and a bit southern. Um, and then lastly, uh, the, the uh, figure at the bottom right is tularemia's distribution in the U.S. And you can see that there are fewer cases overall, but they really are concentrated in Missouri, Arkansas, Oklahoma, and, and some in Kansas. And then the last point that I'll make on this slide is at the top right, uh, we really just don't see much Lyme disease in Missouri. Uh, it's really focused on New England, the Northeast, uh, and then a little bit in the Great Lakes region as well, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and a little bit in Michigan as well. And I think one of the things that makes this really challenging in the summer in our area is that there's a broad range of differential diagnoses that um, we are considering when a kid presents with a fever rash illness. Um, and especially this summer is even more challenging because we're seeing so much circulation of seasonal coronaviruses and uh, uh, para-influenza, um, even some RSV. So we're seeing some of our respiratory viral infections that we would more likely see in the fall, winter, uh, in a typical year. But due to the uh, social distancing and other mitigation strategies during, used during COVID, we've seen a shift such that some of these illnesses are happening later. So you have to think about RSV and para-influenza and all the typical bacterial pathogens and Kawasaki disease and, of course, now tick illnesses during this time period when patients present with a febrile illness in your office. So then the, we'll discuss uh, the various diagnoses using cases, uh, and the first case will actually be used to uh, cover several different specific pathogens, but it's one that we see very commonly in our area this time of year. It was a teenage boy who presented with a week of fever to 104, as well as rash. He had other nonspecific symptoms, including myalgias, arthralgias, headache, and a little bit of conjunctivitis. He had pulled a tick from his axilla about a week prior to presentation, and he was really sick when he presented. He was febrile, tachycardic. He had um, diastolic hypotension, required fluid resuscitation, was hypoxemic. And pertinently, he was on Bactrim prophylaxis for a diagnosis of T-cell immunodeficiency. Um, and of course, he had tons of tick exposure living in a very rural area. Uh, these are some of the exam findings. You can see this rash that was uh, occasionally petechial, but sometimes just a macular rash. You can see his conjunctival changes, uh, and then you can see uh, an abnormality in his monocytes on the peripheral smear. Um, his labs were notable for leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, hyponatremia, um, and elevated transaminases, as well as a high ferritin. So what's the diagnosis in this patient? So he had ehrlichiosis. And the incubation period for ehrlichiosis, as well as several of these other diagnoses, is, is fairly wide, so anywhere from five days to two weeks. And the predominant symptoms are very nonspecific, fever, malaise, headache, muscle aches, nausea, vomiting. About a third of people have skin rash, but this is more common in kids than adults. So we're more likely to see a rash in a patient with ehrlichiosis than some of our adult colleagues. Um, and the, the, the rash really can be nonspecific. It can be petechial, can be maculopapular, uh, can present with diffuse erythema. And there are various other nonspecific symptoms that can be seen, including respiratory symptoms. Uh, the patient that I just presented actually had an abnormal chest X-ray due to ehrlichiosis. You can have frank meningitis, meningoencephalitis, and this can progress to really multi-organ injury. Um, and for reasons that are incompletely understood, patients who present with really severe ehrlichiosis often have been on a Bactrim or another sulfa drug. Uh, we don't know why Bactrim precipitates this really severe uh, presentation of ehrlichiosis, but it's something that's been well described. Uh, the classic lab findings are leukopenia and thrombocytopenia, uh, but you could have a normal white blood cell count and still have ehrlichiosis. It would be very unusual to have leukocytosis with ehrlichiosis. Uh, transaminases can be elevated and hyponatremia uh, is relatively common. And then the classic finding um, on a peripheral smear review would be morulae found within the monocytes. 
And there are three species of Ehrlichia that are known to cause human infection. Uh, Ehrlichia chaffiensis is the most common one that we see, and it is the one that has been associated with severe disease and death. And then there are two other species which can cause human infection, Ehrlichia uingii, which was described here in a transplant patient um, uh, by Dr. Storch and a group of physicians. And then a more recent one, uh, Ehrlichia muris, um, I can't say the third word, but it's based on the area where it was found. Um, and when you look at where this, the distribution of religiosis is, it's really here. It's Missouri, Arkansas, and the states around it have the highest concentration of religiosis uh, in the U.S., and that's pretty consistent year over year. And this is just to give you another sense of some of the epidemiology um, that unlike some of the other tick-borne illnesses which have remained pretty stable, you can see that overall there's been an increase in the number of cases of religiosis over time. Some of that may be based on improved diagnostics. Down here at the bottom, you can see that the majority of cases occur over summer, so really between May and August with the peak months in June and July. And then at the top right, you can see that uh, the, the mortality rate is actually highest in children younger than five. Uh, and then the second highest risk for mortality is in those 70 plus. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about why this may be that young children are uh, have higher fatali case fatality rates with ehrlichiosis. <clears throat> This is a curve to show how many Ehrlichia cases we've had at SLCH and Barnes so far this year. So the current year is in yellow, and you can see that depending on the week, we've had zero to one positive Ehrlichia tests in our lab. And then you look at some of the other years, which are um, in different colors, that we've had as many as a handful, maybe seven, eight cases per week, but that we really should start to see uh, an increase over the next few weeks, and definitely over the next couple months. This is our peak time when we see Ehrlichia every year. Diagnosis, uh, PCR is actually the best test that we have. It's most sensitive in the first week of illness, um, but as we all know, we shouldn't withhold treatment uh, to get a diagnosis. We should really be treating if the clinical presentation is suggestive of ehrlichiosis or another tick-borne illness. Uh, serology can be used, although the IgM is very nonspecific, and so then that means you are relying on paired acute and convalescent titers um, with the convalescent titers drawn at least two to four weeks later. So it's really not a way to make an acute diagnosis. And then you may see these morula, uh, which are microcolonies of relichia organisms in the cytoplasm. That would be characteristic, uh, but it's a very insensitive way to make the diagnosis. So if you can send PCR, great, uh, but this is a clinical diagnosis and decisions about treatment should be made based on that. Uh, the recommended treatment is doxycycline, and the duration of therapy is a bit variable, so it's at least five days and at least three days after your fever resolves and you're otherwise clinically improving. That usually ends up being between seven to 14 days for most people. Um, and it's important to know, I think everyone on this uh, um, session will know this already, but it's important to get the message out that doxycycline is indicated uh, for treatment of ehrlichiosis in patients regardless of their age. Um, in our area, we do not recommend prophylactic treatment for tick bites in patients who are asymptomatic. That's really only recommended in Lyme endemic areas, which we are not a part of. But if you've had a tick bite or risk of tick exposure and you develop fever, rash, or other nonspecific symptoms within a couple weeks of that tick exposure, then treatment uh, should be uh, considered and likely is indicated. And a little bit about doxy and young kids. So you guys all know this. So older tetracyclines were linked with cosmetic uh, staining of children's permanent teeth. And so there was this warning that went out in 1970 recommending against tetracycline use in children younger than eight. Uh, but doxycycline is newer. It came out in 1967 and it binds less uh, to calcium and it has not been linked to uh, tooth staining. So there's really no contraindication to using this. And it's it's fascinating to see this. These data are about 10 years old. So hopefully these numbers would be a little bit better if you repeated the survey today. But in 2012, only 35 percent of clinicians correctly chose doxycycline for treatment of suspected RMSF. Just think tick-borne illness in general in kids under than eight. 
And this hesitation and delay in treatment may be what contributes to the increased fatality rate, not only of RMSF, but also ehrlichiosis in these young kids. And then the data that's been more recent, which has made us all feel a lot more confident about using doxy in young kids, uh, was a study done um, in Arizona on an in, in American Indian reservation. And none of the 58 kids who received one or two courses of doxycycline had tetracycline changes of their teeth. Um, and they compared these 58 kids who received doxycycline to 213 controls and their tooth shade was the same and there was no evidence of hypoplasia. So there is no contraindication to using doxycycline in kids younger than eight. That's been pretty well established and we feel comfortable using short courses of doxycycline, which, you know, up to two weeks in kids, including those younger than eight. And I wanted to mention this um, because it's something that has been a really interesting association of what we've seen in, in some patients with severe ehrlichiosis. You guys may know Stephanie Cabler, who is an ID and ICU fellow right now, and then Stephanie Fritz and David Hunstead, who are two of our ID faculty. They recently published a case series of uh, patients diagnosed with ehrlichiosis at Children's Hospital um, and of the 49 kids with ehrlichiosis over the 16 year time period here, eight of them or 16% actually met the diagnosis for a diagnostic criteria for HLH or hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis. Um, interestingly, none of the patients who were tested had genetic uh, mutations associated with HLH. And um, the patients who are treated with doxycycline alone, so treating the underlying or inciting event, um, had didn't any patient treated with doxycycline alone did not experience relapse. So doxycycline is indicated for treatment of these patients. Um, and this uh, was one of the um, um, series that really identified this association between exposure to sulfa drugs and patients who presented with severe ehrlichiosis. So about 60% of those patients who um, were hospitalized with ehrlichiosis had recent exposure to sulfa drugs. So Bactrim in the summer is not without risk. Um, and so now we'll move on from ehrlichiosis to a few other diagnoses that are presenting very similarly to uh, ehrlichiosis with nonspecific symptoms, but would either be found in other parts of the US or would have negative ehrlichia PCR testing. So the first is anaplasmosis, which is actually seen very commonly in New England, um, as well as some of these uh, northern central states, um, Minnesota, Wisconsin. Um, and it used to be called human granulocytic ehrlichiosis, whereas ehrlichiosis was called human monocytic ehrlichiosis. But now we use the terminology of ehrlichiosis and anaplasmosis. And again, same clinical presentation, nonspecific fever, headache, myalgias. Uh, the same PCR that can detect ehrlichia can detect anaplasma, and it's the same treatment of doxycycline. So really, basically, I would consider this the same clinical illness, just in a different part of the country. And another very similar uh, clinical presentation is Heartland virus. This is actually found in Missouri. Uh, it was first identified about 12 years ago in 2009, and there have been about 50 cases that have been reported to date. It's also transmitted by the Lone Star tick. The clinical presentation is identical to ehrlichiosis, um, but in, in fairness, we haven't tested tons of people for this, and so we don't know the full clinical spectrum of those um, uh, of this uh, virus. You can get testing through the CDC, and the way we would do it is a patient who presents with the clinical spectrum consistent with ehrlichiosis with a negative PCR who doesn't respond to doxycycline because there's no specific antiviral therapy and so supportive therapy is really indicated. Whenever you're thinking about Heartland virus, we should also think about Bourbon virus. Uh, this was more recently identified in Bourbon County, Kansas. That's where the name comes from in 2014. And there have been a few sporadic cases in Missouri and Oklahoma similar presentation. Um, the thought is that it's likely transmitted by ticks, but that hasn't been confirmed. And similar to Heartland virus, testing would be through the CDC and uh, doxycycline and other antibiotics have no activity since this is a viral pathogen. And so supportive treatment is indicated for this illness. Okay, 
So now we'll move away from ehrlichiosis into a different sort of disease presentation. Uh, this is probably pretty familiar to everyone here. So a recent tick bite um, and has this rash which has petechial components on the fingers, also has lesions on the soles of the feet at the upper right you can see and then ultimately develops purpuric lesions um, and really a severe clinical illness. So this is RMSF. Uh, this can be transmitted by a few different types of ticks, including in our region, the American dog tick and the brown dog tick. Um, it has a long uh, incubation, potential incubation period, up to 12 days from tick exposure. And the early symptoms are super nonspecific. So we have to have a high index of suspicion uh, for this diagnosis because patients, when they present in the first three days of illness, almost never have rash. So they'll have fever, headache, nausea, vomiting, myalgias. They may have edema uh, of their hands or around their eyes, but um, all just nonspecific symptoms. The rash usually appears two to four days after the fever starts. And while 90% have a rash at some point during their illness, very few have it in the first three days, which is when most people are presenting for medical care. Um, and classically, it would be these small macular lesions on the wrists or the ankles that spread to the trunk and then become diffuse. But, you know, it can be a little bit of a nonspecific rash. And then petechia purpura would be a late finding. Of course, the feared outcomes are really a multi-organ injury and, um, you know, ICU admission and potentially death. Um, hopefully, we can avoid these with early identification and treatment. And the associated lab findings would be thrombocytopenia, hyponatremia, and elevated transaminases. So all of those would be similar to ehrlichiosis, uh, but you would be less likely to see leukopenia with RMSF. Typically, the white count is normal, perhaps slightly elevated with RMSF. In terms of the local epi, so you can see that like with ehrlichiosis, the number of cases is increasing over time and that the, the highest incidents are kind of in the, uh, you know, um, Missouri and surrounding states and extending a little bit eastern and a little bit southern. It, primarily in summer months, extending really from April through October, but the peak incidence in June and July, like with these other tick illnesses, uh, and you can see that older adults are most likely to be, um, are the, um, where most cases are diagnosed in, in older adults in terms of RMSF. Diagnosis is different from ehrlichiosis. So unfortunately, PCR is really insensitive for RMSF, and that's because rickettsia infect the endothelial cells that line blood vessels and don't circulate uh, peripherally in, in the blood. And so um, you really cannot, uh, uh, you can't develop a sensitive PCR test. So we rely on serology, which we all know has limitations because we need a, both an acute and convalescent titers to make the diagnosis. So like with what we discussed with ehrlichiosis, it's really a clinical diagnosis and treatment uh, should, be, uh, uh, should not be withheld while awaiting diagnostic tests. Doxycycline is first line, and really there's no good second line. So doxycycline is, is the answer for pretty much all cases. Chloramphenicol is technically second line, but I think most of us would be less familiar with using that agent and more comfortable using doxycycline. And importantly, early uh, treatment with doxycycline is associated with improved outcomes. So um, severe complications are much more likely uh, to be identified if doxycycline therapy isn't started within the first five days of illness. Generally, patients respond within 48 hours of initiation of therapy, but I will say from clinical experience in the hospital, that's definitely not always the case. Um, and so the duration of therapy, like with ehrlichiosis, minimum of at least five days of therapy and at least three days after the fever subsides and there's clinical improvement, which typically ends up being a seven to 14 day course. Um, and we really haven't identified doxycycline resistance in, in RMSF. And so uh, this is the, the standard of care. And what's been described more recently um, is that there are other rickettsial pathogens that you'll either described, uh, see described as um, spotted fever rickettsiosis or spotted fever group rickettsiosis. Um, they have a similar spectrum of illness uh, as this, the manifestations of RMSF, but typically less severe um, presentations. They may have fever, headache, and rash. 
Uh, interestingly, they may have this eschar that you see at the bottom right at the site of the tick bite, which would be very unusual in RMSF uh, diagnosis. So the a lot of the serology testing for RMSF uh, has cross-reactivity with other rickettsial species. So you would send serology and treatment is also with doxycycline. And what we see in terms of outcomes is, is, I think, very interesting. So when you look at spotted fever group as a whole, the mortality rate is quite low, about a half a percent. But when you look specifically at RMSF, the fatality rate is, is higher, uh, up to 5 to 10 percent of cases. And the curve at the bottom left shows that while the number of cases has increased over time with RMSF, that's the red curve, the um, case fatality rate has actually gone down a bit in part because we're really likely to use doxycycline when we're suspecting this illness, and also because we're um, identifying these other uh, rickettsial diseases in the spotted fever group, which uh, have less severe clinical manifestations and, and are not really associated with, with risk of mortality. And then what you see on the right is similar to uh, ehrlichiosis, that the highest uh, mortality is actually in kids younger than five. And, you know, part of this is that uh, potentially they presented with nonspecific symptoms and we were more suspicious of a viral illness early on and, and didn't make the diagnosis or were hesitant to treat um, early on during the illness. So really, we should have the, a high index of suspicion for these tick-borne illnesses and a, and a low threshold for treatment. And importantly, if we treat early, the outcomes are better. Uh, so just similar uh, data presented slightly differently that um, kids less than 10 or five times more likely to die from RMSF than adults. And while kids represent 6% of spotted fever cases, they represent 22% of spotted fever uh, group uh, rickettsial uh, deaths. So really just doxy, 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 and the earlier, the better. I will say that, you know, I was just having a discussion actually with one of the ED physicians here, and it's like we see so many febrile illnesses this time of year, right? And not all of them are tick-borne. Uh, so, you know, I usually use criteria like, um, you know, if the kid clearly presents with a respiratory uh, symptom complex, I'm less likely to start treatment early with doxycycline because I'll be more suspicious of a uh, respiratory viral pathogen. If a kid has had, you know, um, uh, if the fever resolves spontaneously, I'm, I'm likely not going to start therapy. Um, otherwise, if a kid's had three days of fever with nonspecific symptoms and um, uh, an exposure history that could be consistent with tick exposure, uh, meaning that they were out, you know, in the woods, out on farmland, spent a lot of time in rural areas, then I would have a low threshold for starting therapy in a patient who had three or more days of fever and presented with nonspecific symptoms, or of course, any patient who presents in summer months who looks critically ill, um, then, then I would definitely start doctoring cycling as soon as possible. Okay, let's move into our next symptom complex. And so I think this will be clear to everyone. So you have the classic lawnmower, maybe you ran over a bunny. Uh, bunnies are blamed for tularemia all the time. And then deer flies and deer ticks, um, they can be associated with uh, Francisella tularensis or tularemia. And so the different um, exposure routes lead to different clinical presentations. So if you're bitten by a tick or a deer fly, then you might have this ulceral glandular form where you get an ulcer at the site of the bite and then a lymphadenopathy regionally, or you may just have lymphadenopathy and present with a glandular form. If you've had direct contact with any infected animal, then you could get any form, including oculoglandular, if there is exposure um, to the eyes. Rabbits and rodents are the, the animals in our area that we classically think of. If you drink contaminated water, that could lead to oropharyngeal. And then, of course, if you inhale uh, aerosols contaminated with tularemia, you could get the most severe forms, pneumonic um, or typhoidal, typhoidal forms of tularemia, which are associated with high mortality. And uh, similarly, lab exposure could lead to any form. So if we're suspicious of uh, tularemia, we really need to let the lab staff know before they start the cultures. And uh, you can see at the bottom right that Arkansas is number one, but Missouri is usually number two or three each year in the number of tularemia cases nationally.
and that data is shown here. Unlike some of the other tick-borne illnesses, the incidence of tularemia has actually gone down overall since the 1950s. There are many different reasons that could have contributed to that, but it's been pretty stable uh, over the past five years. And you can see Arkansas has the most number of cases pretty much every year, and that Oklahoma and Missouri uh, really uh, change a bit from year to year in terms of who is number two and who is number three. What we see is um, an incubation period that's even longer than some of the other tick-borne illnesses. So on average three to five days, but can be as short as one day after exposure and as long as 21 days after exposure. And the most common form in adults is ulceroglandular, which we discussed previously. An ulcer develops at the site of the tick bite and then regional lymphadenopathy is associated. Um, and But in kids, the most common form is actually glandular without the ulcer. And uh, that's after a tick bite as well. And then there can be this really impressive ulceroglandular form uh, when there's eye exposure of, of Francisella tularensis, um, maybe during butchering of an infected animal. Um, Erica Hayes and Alexis Elward always tell the story of someone who was swinging around, uh, I think it was a, was it a squirrel? I can't remember, some dead animal, and some of the blood went in the, the child's eye, and then he developed oculoglandular uh, tularemia. Um, and then, um, you know, uh, there's also associated uh, lymphadenopathy in addition to the ocular inflammation with the oculoglandular form. Diagnosis. So if you um, grow Francisella tularensis in culture, that's the definitive diagnosis. But uh, typically we make the diagnosis based on clinical presentation and serology. And you would want to send um, uh, convalescent titers about four weeks after illness onset. And you'd be looking for a fourfold or greater increase in, in antibody titers between acute and convalescent titers. Treatment for more severe forms is um, the streptomycin, we usually can't find that nowadays, so uh, IV gentamicin. Um, but actually, if it's a patient who presents with a relatively mild form, maybe glandular or even ulceral glandular forms, we typically start with ciprofloxacin and doxycycline as second line therapy. There was a very small case series which uh, showed um, a slightly higher risk of treatment failure with doxycycline, so usually cipro is our, our, our first line treatment for mild cases. Okay, so next we'll move on to a different um, uh, clinical spectrum. So this uh, particular patient was a teenager who came in with a rash and facial weakness. You can see that the rash on his thigh and on his foot was sort of a, a targetoid rash and he had multiple lesions throughout um, his body. And then he subsequently, or er, he also developed left facial weakness um, and tingling. Uh, and of course, about four to six weeks prior to presentation, he had traveled to New England. And while he had no known tick bites, he had gone to this island, which was like uh, commonly called Tick Island, uh, and had camped there. So uh, you guessed it, this is Lyme disease. In, in the US, the most common pathogen is Borrelia burgdorferi. But in Europe, there are other forms of species of Borrelia that are also uh, fairly common. And so in Europe, uh, neurologic disease as a long-term complication of Lyme is more common than in the U.S. <coughs> Excuse me. In the U.S., New England and the East Coast is where we see the vast majority of cases. After that, Wisconsin and Minnesota. And then some people believe that Lyme is endemic in Northern California. Excuse me, sorry, I just had to take a drink real quick. Um, but that's um, a, a less likely area to uh, be exposed to Lyme. And so uh, the black-legged tick is, is where uh, what carries Lyme disease on the East Coast and upper Midwest. And interestingly, we um, a study that was performed in Missouri a long time ago in 1994 found that 2% of Lone Star ticks in our area and American dog ticks in our area uh, carried Lyme disease. Uh, but we really see very few cases acquired locally, um, and some people would say none. So we're not considered a Lyme endemic area here in Missouri. Like with other tick-borne illnesses, the summer is the predominant season for Lyme disease. You can see the bottom at the, the figure at the bottom right that the more than half of cases occur in June and July. And uh, the incubation period is actually even longer than some of the others. It's a median of 11 days, but can be as long as a month after exposure. 
and the late manifestations like arthritis can occur months later. The most common forms are early localized and then early disseminated. So early localized would be one, erythema migraines or targetoid rash, and they may have associated systemic symptoms such as fever, malaise, headache, arthralgias, myalgias. And then early disseminated typically has multiple EM lesions um, that occur several weeks after the tick bite. Um, you can see cranial nerve palsies, uh, you can see associated meningitis, meningoencephalitis, and there may be associated nonspecific systemic symptoms here too. And then lastly, late disease is, is most commonly presents as Lyme arthritis. Uh, so this is typically one large joint. Uh, typically it's the knee, as you can see at the picture at the bottom right. Um, and this can occur in about 60% of untreated Lyme cases, but is much lower if treatment is, is, is uh, initiated earlier on. Um, there is also neurologic uh, Lyme disease, which can occur as a late manifestation, although that's less common than Lyme arthritis. And typically this is for patients who were not treated early on uh, during an early localized or early disseminated Lyme disease. And while we really don't see much Lyme disease in our area, um, we do in other parts of the U.S. and so wanted to review the most common uh, manifestations. So by far the most common is the erythema migrans or targetoid rash. Uh, second most common is arthritis, which occurs as a late finding. Uh, and then lastly, uh, uh, facial palsies, cranial nerve palsies can occur in about 9% of patients. When you look at Lyme disease, you can see that Missouri is really, really um, very few cases of Lyme disease diagnosed locally. We have between one and three cases diagnosed each year over the past five years. And you compare that to 25,000 to 30,000 diagnosed in the rest of the US, really focally concentrated on New England, uh, but with a fair amount also in Wisconsin, Minnesota, a little bit of Michigan. Um, so unless there's been travel to a Lyme endemic area, we really don't have suspicion for Lyme disease in our area. Importantly, diagnosis of Lyme disease is very complicated and uh, tedious and it can lead to a lot of confusion with patients and misdiagnoses. So what's recommended is a two-tiered testing algorithm for Lyme disease. And the first is an EIA or IFA antibody testing that's very sensitive, but that is just a screening test. So if that's negative, you have excluded Lyme disease if it's been more than a few weeks since symptoms started. And if it's positive, then you have to go to the confirmatory test. Historically, that was always Western blot, but more recently, you can use a different type of EIA than the screening uh, test, um, and either is acceptable. So you have to have a positive first test, a positive second test in order to confirm the diagnosis of, of Lyme disease. And because these, West, these immunoblots on the Western blot are a little finicky, if you've had symptoms for more than 30 days, you should not be interpreting IgMs. You should only be interpret interpreting IgGs. And there are very specific IgM and IgG immunoblots that need to be positive in order to confirm the diagnosis. You can occasionally culture um, Borrelia out of skin lesions. And then if you have a patient who presents with arthritis, you should send a Lyme PCR because that is often positive. Uh, it's not sensitive, but it's often positive in, in patients with Lyme arthritis. And then for Lyme disease, uh, we won't go through each one of these indications independently, but importantly for the earlier forms of Lyme disease like erythema migraines, uh, amoxicillin or doxycycline are appropriate uh, therapies. And then for essentially every other type of um, uh, presentation, doxycycline oral is appropriate, including for CNS findings. So there is rarely an, an indication for ceftriaxone, although some people will use it for refractory arthritis. Uh, typically, uh, doxycycline is, is, is um, appropriate treatment both for arthritis, um, meningitis, and other chronic forms of disease. And uh, then again, for the earlier forms, you can use doxy or amoxicillin. In our area, what we do see that has a very similar clinical presentation is STARI or Southern Tick Associated Rash Illness. You can see, I remember getting this call, this is 
I think during fellowship, um, but they had this targetoid rash right at the site where they had removed a tick from this little bitty baby. Um, there may not be any associated symptoms, but there may be non-specific uh, non um, uh, symptomatic uh, illness like fever, fatigue, headache, myalgias, arthralgias. Uh, we believe this to be transmitted by the lone star tick, um, but we're not totally sure because it's a clinical diagnosis. There's no diagnostic test that's available. And while we don't know if there are any um, long, while we haven't identified long-term sequelae of STARI like we have with untreated Lyme disease, um, we have a low threshold for treatment with amoxicillin or doxycycline. Um, and especially since amoxicillin is an appropriate therapy, I, I think that most people in our ID group would recommend treatment with either amox or doxycycline if they're suspicious of STARI in our area. Okay, so we spend a lot of time talking about diagnosis, presentation, and treatment of tick-borne illnesses, but what are the basic things to really recommend to your patients uh, to prevent tick-borne infections to begin with? So one thing you can do is avoid tick-infested areas, but of course that's difficult this time of year. So really things that people can do are wearing protective clothing that covers you, um, using insecticides that contain DEET, um, and you can pre-treat your clothing with permethrin, which is actually very effective. Um, and then in order to kill ticks after exposure, uh, you can heat your clothing on high heat uh, for 10 minutes and that will kill the ticks. And then of course you should shower within a couple hours of going to a tick um, uh, infested area and then check yourself uh, for ticks. And then the last thing that we'll just briefly go over is how you're, how it's recommended to remove a tick because I think people ask us this a lot. So we usually recommend tweezers. You grasp the tick as close to the skin surface as possible and pull up with steady, even pressure. You don't want to twist or jerk off, um, the tick around as you might break things off. And then wash the area with soap and water or rubbing alcohol after removing the tick. And then this question I think gets asked of us a lot, and I briefly alluded to it earlier, but in terms of post-exposure prophylaxis for tick bites. So if you live in New York or in some part of New England, uh, which is a Lyme endemic area, there actually is a recommendation that if you've had a tick that's been attached for more than 36 hours, which I must say may be difficult to know in certain cases, but in any case, if you remove a tick and you live in a, and the tick was acquired in the Lyme endemic area, then prophylaxis with a single large dose of doxycycline is recommended. However, if you don't live in a Lyme endemic area, post-exposure prophylaxis is not recommended for Lyme disease um, uh, or to prevent Lyme disease. So what we recommend that people do is monitor for symptoms of a tick-borne illness, and then we would start therapy early on if they develop symptoms within two weeks. So no Lyme prophylaxis in our area, but in Lyme endemic areas, you would give in prophylaxis after tick bites. Okay, so we covered a lot of ground, but uh, hopefully it was a nice review of the tick-borne illnesses that we see in our area and even some that we really don't. Uh, importantly, Lyme disease is not endemic to Missouri, but is to other parts of the U.S. And really, in our area in summer, we need to focus on history of exposure to areas with potential for ticks, uh, not just known tick bites, since some of these are so tiny. Uh, most of these illnesses are, are have a very nonspecific presentation, and so we have to have a, a high index of suspicion to um, recognize these and diagnose them early so we can start appropriate therapy to um, uh, avoid more severe manifestations down the road. Um, a single treatment course of doxycycline is safe, and we don't run the risk of teeth staining, even in kids younger than eight, and that in our area, tick uh, antibiotic prophylaxis is not indicated after tick bites. So uh, thank you so much for your attention and please feel free to reach out uh, with any questions. The best way to get a hold of me is to email me at patrickjreich at wustil.edu. Thanks so much.